All right, well, I think we'll get started. Um, once again, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this webinar on learning from community stories, how to engage on energy efficiency. Uh, my name is Elena Chia, and I also have my colleague Kim Vanderwall with us from the Fraser Basin Council. So this webinar is part of our First Nations Home Energy Safe program. Uh, so FBC is working with both First Nations communities and support organizations to help reduce energy use on and housing on reserve. And part of what we do is a webinar series. So this is a component of that. Um, we host in-person workshops. Uh, we have our one-on-one -on -one support program where we provide some funding for training initiatives. And we also have our energy efficiency uh, retrofit pilot program. So through this program, we look to share stories about what communities are doing on energy efficiency, uh, provide learning events, and help build local capacity in energy efficiency. Um, and I'd also like to thank our funders, the Real Estate Foundation of BC, BC Housing, BC Ministry of Energy and Mines, and BC Hydro. Uh, so I wanted to show our website where you can take a look at some case studies of community successes, as you'll see um, over here on the left side. Um, we also have a, a portal of learning and funding resources. Um, if you want to stay connected to the events and news that we have, you can subscribe, which is over here on the right. Um, and if you want to take a look at what we've had in previous webinars, you can go under our webinar series um, and visit our webinar library. So some logistics for this webinar, we're going to keep everyone's audio muted uh, to limit background noise. If you have any questions, you can type them into your question box. Um, we'll have our Q&A at the end of the presentation. And if you experience any technical difficulties, you can type them into the question box or you can send us an email at FraserBasin at gmail.com. Oh, so today our speaker is Courtney Crane from um, the University of British Columbia. Uh, she's been working with the Fraser Basin Council as a student researcher since November um, through the First Nations and Indigenous Studies program. So she is in her fourth year of a double major in both First Nation Studies and Geography. Um, her research interests are in indigenous methods for naturally increasing the biodiversity of ecosystems as well as water governance. She is also a member of the Key First Nation in Saskatchewan, um, who has spent most of her life in Vancouver and has also spent some time living abroad in Brazil. Uh, she has a diploma in film production from Vancouver Film School and is interested in using documentary storytelling as a means of affecting social change. Uh, she's previously worked at CTV for Story, uh, where she gained valuable experience in researching and interviewing, as well as filming and editing. So at this point, I'm going to pass it over to Courtney. Hello, good morning. Thank you, Elena. So before I begin, um, I'd like to express my gratitude to the Musqueam people for the opportunity to live and to study um, on their unceded territory. Uh, this is really important because um, 
most of my research that was done for this project was done on Musqueam territory at UBC. Um, so uh, I just like to acknowledge that. As well, um, I'd like to thank all the people who participated in this research project. Um, without your insight and um, your, your knowledge, this project really wouldn't have been possible. So I'm very grateful for that. Thank you. And also I'd like to thank the Fraser Basin Council um, for highlighting the voices of community members. Uh, the information that's contained in this report is the product of community interview findings. Uh, so the views that are expressed throughout are therefore from different community participants um, and not necessarily the views of Fraser Basin Council. Um, what Fraser Basin Council did was they provided the stage for these issues to be addressed and um, I'm really thankful for that. So a little bit about me um, just before we get started. I'm. I'm from um, the, I'm doing my research at the University of British Columbia. I'm a student there um, in the First Nations and Indigenous Studies program. And uh, this research was part of um, a joint project between um, the FNIS program and Fraser Basin Council. Uh, what happened was um, part of uh, gaining a degree in First Nations and Indigenous Studies, we have to do um, a community research component. And so this was part of that um, for fulfilling my degree. So the research um, that we did was um, about energy efficiency in First Nations communities. And the research question is, what are effective and creative strategies that people in First Nations communities can use to reduce household energy consumption? And the thing that we're really interested in knowing is how communities are working towards energy efficiency. So the process for this research, um, after, after teaming up with Fraser Basin Council, um, well, first of all, Fraser Basin Council um, sent, you know, this, this research um, project, the, the proposal um, to, to UBC. Um, and once I saw it, I, I realized that this was really research that I wanted to undertake um, because, you know, it really combined um, a lot of the things that are, are really important to me. Um, so after doing the project proposal, uh, we got right into ethics and ethics, um, we had to apply for ethics proposal to the university um, research ethics board. And this was just to ensure um, that when I was doing research with participants that, um, that things were going to be done in a really good way. And um, so although the ethics was a really grueling process, it, it was really beneficial. Um, after that, I conducted a literature review and the literature review really, it, you know, I focused on probably about 40 different sources and um, it provided a, a, a wide insight into energy efficiency in First Nations communities. Um, however, what I noticed was is that there was not a lot of literature specifically on the community engagement aspect of energy efficiency. So sources would either talk about community engagement or they talk about, you know, renewable energies or energy efficiency, but um, I didn't really find many sources that combined all of this in the academic literature. However, um, in the gray literature on Online, there, there were more sources regarding this. Um, after that, I conducted interviews with seven different community members and I wrote the findings into a research paper. Um, as well, my, the final part of my presentation is doing this webinar. So why is this important? Well, energy has the potential to eliminate dependence on hydro corporations and government funding. 
Um, as well, energy efficiency is intimately connected to several other aspects of life, such as housing, capacity building, and self-governance. So this is extremely important. It's tied up in so many other aspects of um, life, especially in Indigenous communities. So um, it really touches on a lot of, of different areas. And a lot of the people who I spoke with saw energy efficiency as a means to live in a better way with the earth, but also to, to achieve this independence um, that a lot of people really want um, to build capacity, um, to build housing and, and to just build, you know, better communities. So housing, um, I could not begin to speak about energy efficiency without at least touching on housing. Um, this is because, um, as many of you probably know, there is a housing crisis in many First Nations communities across Canada. Um, so this is characterized by uh, inadequate housing, you know, mold, um, and a lot of times it's difficult to speak about energy efficiency when um, housing is in such a sad state in many communities. So, you know, a lot of people, um, they can't even really begin to think about, you know, what um, energy efficient light bulbs or um, extra insulation would do if they have a front door that doesn't close properly, or, you know, um, heat is escaping through their houses in, in several other locations. So energy efficiency is really something that should be developed alongside housing because they are so intimately connected. Um, a lot of participants spoke about the importance of building design um, and some people feel that there should be a cultural component to the housing design because often in, in many communities people people practice um, they have tra traditional practices that aren't always um, there they can't always be practiced in you know these these regular houses because there's not really space for that for example um, a lot of people like to use their basement to can fish or to tan hides. So there really needs to be construction that helps to minimize the contaminants and mold and, um, you know, to um, create insulation in the house so that people can be practicing these, these traditions um, continually um, in a safe manner in a, in a clean place. Um, so that's something that a lot of communities really want to work towards is um, embracing traditional designs um, in order to be able to uphold these traditional practices. So this image here shows a bit about um, how energy efficiency is connected to so many other aspects of life. Um, you know, a lot of times it's really tied to renewable energies. So people, people who want to attain energy efficiency, they're not just looking at, you know, reducing their use. It's also part of a wider and bigger community energy plan that will enable them to, to live better with the earth. Um, a lot of people see energy efficiency as, as a means to achieving energy independence. Um, you know, and uh, as I already mentioned, housing is, is tied to all of this. In truth, all of these things on this slide are really tied together. And um, there's a lot of overlap between all of them. Um, chief and Council, it's extremely important that Chief and Council support these initiatives because when they do, then it, you know, it provides that push to the rest of the community to be able to be developing these things. Um, and community planning um, around energy efficiency is extremely important because what I found in doing this research is a lot of the people want the same things you know they want to live in a good way with the earth um, they want to have clean renewable energy and eliminate dependence on fossil fuels and the thing is um, but it's looking at how we can get there how we can can move towards that 
um, also provincial hydro corporations. A lot of people expressed a desire to, you know, step away from their dependence on provincial hydro corporations because uh, they see it as a way of reinforcing uneven power relationships between um, Indigenous peoples and the government. Um, so a lot of people really want energy dependence, um, which means, you know, um, housing is really tied to this because if you have good good quality housing and you know you don't you don't have to be spending money on that energy in the first place so um, housing energy depend independence and economics and capacity building they're all really um, interlinked together because um, you know what communities are really wanting to do is they're wanting to be able to build up this workforce within their community so that um, they can build these projects independently without having to ask the the provincial or federal governments for for help in doing these. So what is motivating people to become energy efficient? Uh, the two main things I found were concern for the environment and saving money. So to avoid high energy bills. And um, something that's tied to both of these is people really want to eliminate that dependency on fossil fuels. That's um, something that almost everybody I spoke to really expressed a desire to do. And um, part of this is, is being incorporated into housing design and construction. So like I said before, these things are all interlinked. And um, when people are starting to develop these things, it's not developing energy efficiency in isolation. It, it's really developing it in conjunction with housing and, and other renewable energy projects. And also, um, like I mentioned, to gain independence from provincial power corporations um, was a huge thing that um, almost everybody I spoke to, to noted that they, they wanted to achieve. <coughs> So basically, as one as one participant I spoke to put it, um, he said, you know, if you have to pay somebody for a service that your community needs, then you're under their thumb. He said, you know, no, no matter what, they're the ones who are going to be setting the price and um, the community isn't really, even if they develop a good relationship with, with hydro corporations, it's still not something that um, that's sort of grassroots from the community. Um, and exploitation of natural resources is, is a huge thing that's really troubling to a lot of people. Um, because these huge uh, mega projects, these big dams, they're fundamentally harmful to ecosystems and biodiversity. Um, a lot of people argue that, oh yeah, well, you know, at least the dams, it's not, um, it's not producing that that carbon into the atmosphere, like, um, you know, like fossil fuels do. But there is a huge impact to fish, um, and also to other biodiversity. And people people don't see this as the right way forward. Also, a lot of these big um, these big dams are being constructed on contested territories. So that's either unceded territories or treaty lands, when quite often the people who, um, who are of those lands are against such projects. Um, and this is also part of the settler colonial um, capitalist system, which, you know, um, governments funding for, for energy projects and housing and, um, you know, if, if First Nations people want to fight against this, if First Nations people are against Site C or against any other major hydro projects, you know, they are ultimately fighting against them in Canadian courtrooms. And there's, you know, there's automatically, you know, a power imbalance there. And also, you know, that's not based on traditional Indigenous governance structures. So, so it's just wrapped up in all these different power relations and people really want to get out of that. Um, they want to do things from within their communities um, so that they don't have to rely on this because a lot of times, you know, um, especially in remote communities, people are having to pay really, really high um, delivery costs to these power corporations that have gained their wealth 
in exploiting indigenous indigenous lands and so people are are often a lot of the people i spoke to are, are really um against this and trying to look for ways for better ways forward um, that are grassroots from within the communities so this is something from um it's it's um a quote by patrick wolf from his article is Settler Colonialism and the Elimination of the Native. And basically what it says is settler colonialism is a structure and not an event. And the thing is, this structure, this settler colonial structure is powered both literally and figuratively through hydro corporations. It, you know, that gives massive amounts of wealth to Canadian and provincial governments. And um, a lot of times, you know, uh, First Nations people in their communities are having to pay these fees that are supporting these structures when they are structures that, um, you know, have historically and even present day have made First Nations people be really um, dispossessed from their territories and dispossessed from their lands. So it's it's quite controversial and there's a, there's a lot of um emotion bound up in these things so when i was speaking with people you know these were things that came up you know even though uh, my focus is on you know community engagement around energy efficiency this is sort of the the background that energy efficiency um, exists within and this quote here from zoe todd which says through colonial sleight of hand, the Canadian state has tried to get us to forget that fish too are citizens within the territories that we inhabit, that we share treaties and governance relationships with fish, plants, and other more than human agents. And so this is really just to bring it back to um, the fact that this conversation is really not just human centered, that there are um, that all our relations are, are impacted by these, these decisions that we make and um, by these, um, by the way that we are powering our homes. So, so it's really quite important, not just to us, but to, to animals as well. So the key findings of my research, um, as I've, I've touched on most of all of these already, um, independence, um, people, people feel that energy is part of a bigger movement towards creating economically and socially sustainable communities. Um, this was really, really important. And people want to move away from current systems of, of applying to the government for funding. Um, and of course, this isn't something that's going to happen overnight. And um, also, this isn't to take away from, you know, the movements towards reconciliation that a lot of um, government organizations and a lot of, um, you know, provincial hydro corporations are taking. Um, but it's just, it's just to say that um, inherently the system that it, it is, is um, it's very problematic. So what do people want? People want good quality, energy efficient housing and clean renewable energies. So how do they develop that? Community engagement is a huge move towards that. Um, and people spoke about inviting everybody to come together. Um, this was really key, having a social gathering to talk about key issues, not just surrounding energy efficiency, but um, around other things that, you know, are going on in the community, but um, people who, who said that they were developing, you know, a community energy plan, it was always usually tied to this, um, this community engagement and in inviting everybody to come together. And one of the participants joked um, about tea with the chief, and that was a way that their community um, spoke about to, to get people to come together and have like a little Sunday tea. And so that people, you know, they could talk about, um, the changes that they want to see in the community and and just their ideas um, for energy efficiency and for housing and for for whatever is is going on um, also long-term community planning um, people spoke about the importance of setting long-term and short-term goals um, but that the short-term goals should lead to the long-term goals and when i speak about long-term goals um, i don't mean 70 years i mean like 700 years people are really looking that seven gen 
generations into the future. People are, are really trying to um, not just look at what's going to be sustainable for now, but what's going to be sustainable for, you know, their grandchildren and their great grandchildren. So, so really envisioning how they want to see their communities far into the future is um, something that's really key. And then once you implement those plans, just checking back to see if you're actually meeting those goals, because um, that's also really key. Because if, um, you know, if power changes all in the community and, um, you know, there's a new chief and council, then it, at least if you've got your goals written down, people can look back and say, you know what, that's that's something we planned on before and that's something that's important to us and we're going to go go forward with that. Um, and then also asking what the community values. So, you know, what is important to the community? What changes do they want to see? And this is something that can be either a directive of, of chief and council or it can also be community driven. So some of the methods of community engagement that um, people spoke about um, were community meetings. Um, people really felt that community meetings were important to, to have a social space to, to discuss issues. Um, also community consultation. Uh, one, ha one community that I'll speak about later in the, um, later on in the research findings, um, they used a community consultant to go in and speak to um, every single person in the community individually in their homes to find out what was important to them um, regarding energy efficiency. Uh, community newsletters are also key. Um, and they're key not just in regards to energy efficiency, but also into um, also for keeping the community like up to date on on important issues. Um, a lot of people noted community newsletters were um, a very important method of keeping their community together. And actually, I spoke with one person from um, a community in northern Ontario. And what happened to their community is they were forced off of their community because of flooding. Um, and this was intentional flooding um, to uh, have different forestry projects and um, to create some dams. And what happened was, is after this community had to leave, um, you know, some people went to urban centers, other people went to surrounding communities, but, you know, um, they said that community newsletters were a key aspect of what kept their community um, engaged and connected um, during those, I think it was like 70 years that they, that they were, um, you know, away from their community that they couldn't even be there because of the flooding. So so community newsletters can be really a, quite a powerful thing to keep people together. Um, also, social media. Um, there's a passive housing Facebook page currently. Uh, when I was when I was uh, contacting a lot of communities, um, especially in remote northern regions, what I found is a lot of people didn't even have um, an email address listed, but instead they had, you know, a Twitter page or they had their Facebook page and um, and also a phone number list, listed. So when I called a lot of these communities and I, I asked, you know, can I send you an email? You know, of course they had an email set up, but they said that they didn't really even use that because I guess by the time um, energy came to their communities, you know, um, people were using Facebook more and people were using Twitter more. So people weren't even really using um, email as much as before to, to communicate with friends. So, um, so social media has become really important um, uh, for community engagement in, in a lot of these remote communities. Also, um, as I mentioned before, band council initiatives are really, really important. Um, because if this is something that um, chief and council is prioritizing, then um, you know funding can can be put into it, and you know um, different programs can be implemented. And so, so if there is that support from chief and council, then that can go a long way. Um, and finally, school programs. Um, people really liked it when their children would go um, and learn about energy efficiency and learn about you know energy use and consumption at school and then they'd come home and they would teach that to their parents um, people found that to be really positive 
So building capacity, building capacity is a, a really key thing that um, I think everybody who I spoke to um, said was really important to them. Um, people want to build capacity within their communities so that people have the skills they need to build houses and to build community buildings. Um, like I said, this is this is part um, it's part of a system, you know, that is really the result of these uneven power relationships between um, governments and First Nations people. Um, you know, I was really surprised when I spoke with with people in in communities, and we'd be speaking uh, about energy efficiency. And some people, you know, they brought up brought up residential school and different traumas that their community members have faced. And um, this is also tied to to energy because. Um, and capacity building as well, because um, one person participant told me that you know a lot of the people in their community went to residential school, and so this taught a system of of constantly having to ask when you wanted to do something. So, for example, if people in the community wanted a house or they wanted a community center. Um, they would just automatically think to, you know, apply to the government for funding or, um, you know, um, ask for ask somebody else to to get that to ask permission for it. Um, and the person I interviewed said, you know, when the young people started doing that, they knew it was really problematic because that's not something that is of their culture or their tradition. It's something that's been, you know, the result of a really destructful, uh, destructive imposed system. And so people want to get out of that. People want to be able to say, you know what, we want to build houses in our community. So we are going to build them from within. We're going to build our community buildings from within. Um, and that will also instill a sense of pride and, and just um, it'll be positive for the community because it's going to be teaching young people, you know, to have these skills to build these, these buildings and community buildings. So the case studies. Um, so first off, I'll look at how community engagement can be a really powerful tool to solve energy related problems. Um, in one community I spoke with, when high power bills were, were plaguing them, um, they hired a local energy consultant to address this pro problem. So what happened was um, when Hydro One updated their smart meters, um, they had the option of going back two years to charge for lost costs, and they did. And so what happened is people in this remote northern community were receiving huge energy bills that they just could not pay. And so what was happening is um, council had to take funding out of other areas um, to pay people's hydro bills just to, affo to avoid uh, massive disconnection, um, mass massive disconnections in the community. And so this caused major social problems. Um, and what happened was people were getting really depressed because you know people were having to choose between food, rent, and energy. And the thing is in these remote Northern communities, energy is really expensive and it's also necessary because people, um, uh, people are, are cold in winter it's um and this community had a lot of elders as well and so the elders they could not be going out and chopping wood and heating their homes that way because what's happening is in a lot of these these remote communities people are really relying on um on burning wood for for heating their homes this has other problems um with um with causing mold in the houses afterwards. And so, and also a lot of people just can't do this. A lot of, you know, a lot of people can't go out and chop wood, um, you know, when it's 20 below and then heat their houses that way. So what this, what this community did, oh, excuse me for one second. Um, and so, um, sorry about that. So this was, um, just to clarify, this was um, in Ontario in um, a really remote northern community. And, um, and so what happened was the community came together and they hired a community engagement consultant. So 
Um, this consultant, she visited every home in the community to talk to people about energy problems that they were experiencing. And after she was aware of the depth of the problem, the consultant began communicating with Hydro One on behalf of the community. And the results were really, really powerful because they were able to get the charges reduced. And now they're in the process of developing an agreement with Hydro One regarding delivery fees. Um, the work is not over because what they want to do is they just want to eliminate the delivery fees altogether. Um, and, you know, this, this comes back to also the community energy plan um, as well as the community newsletter because uh, one of the ways that the community was able to you know gain access to everybody's house and, and have people invite them in was by advertising it in the newsletter and so once that newsletter went out and people saw that oh yeah you know um, I can I can talk about these problems to somebody and, and this will work towards a solution. Um, it really had positive effects. But um, like I said, the work is, is not over. So um, the type of things that are listed in the newsletters are, you know, they're really diverse. And um, I found that um, Usually they go out like either once a week or once a month and a lot of times when I can uh, connected with communities as well and and sent the initial email asking if anybody wanted to be interviewed. A lot of people responded to me and they said, oh, well, we have a community newsletter. Is it okay if I advertise this in the community newsletter so that, you know, um, anybody who wants to can contact you. So this is just one example of how like a community newsletter can be really successful. So now on to the second case study, which is geothermal energy in Manitoba. So I spoke with somebody at Long Plain First Nation, and what they are doing is they're building capacity by training people to be geothermal installers. So trainees from the community learn the skills um, while doing installations. Um, in the community as well. So 15 people were trained to be geothermal installers, but this was out of 60 to 70 applicants who wanted to be trained. So this just shows how, you know, a lot of people want, um, they want to be skilled in these areas. And so once the opportunity presents itself, then um, a lot of times people jump on board and they're, they're really excited about these things. Oh, sorry. And just an, another thing to mention about um, the the geothermal. This was made possible because of um, a First Nations community that took the the initiative and that they really wanted to hire local people. So a lot of times, that's what I was seeing as well. Is that you know sometimes it just takes one one uh, local company to be hiring people within the community, and it can make a really big positive difference. And um, another thing that that Long Plain um, had problems with when they were developing this is just um, they said that they they felt that the provincial government had a really paternalistic attitude so that when they they were applying for funding to do these projects, um, they they didn't like having to deal with the provincial government because um, the provincial government really wanted to control um, the the direction that the it was going in. And the thing is that that wasn't really um, it was taking it away from being done within the community. So the they're in talks now. Um, Long Plain is they're they're thinking about. Um, developing um, a nonprofit that um, will help um, people get the training that they need. But um, again, these are things that they they move slowly. You know, it, it can't be done overnight unless you have a massive amount of money and somebody can say, "I'm going to you know train the community and do this." So um, you know, so even though these things do they don't happen overnight, they, they are happening and it's it's a really positive thing. So the New Hulk Nation in Bella Coola 
um, I spoke from somebody there and they spoke about how, you know, the ferry's really expensive. There aren't very many op economic opportunities in the community and there's a real need for trades within the community. Um, so what was happening is contractors were coming in from outside of the community and they were, you know, doing substandard work and um, they were really overcharging. So um, again, what they really needed in their community is um, apprentices with the skills um, so that they can do it all from within. And now there are 20 apprentices within the community. So that's, that's another really positive thing. Um, passive housing, I, um, I was really fortunate to speak with somebody from West Oberly First Nations and um, um, it was, it was a really great example of um, how housing can really reduce energy costs. Um, so what they're doing is um, they're building a new health station that's scheduled to break ground in early May. And this is a commercial application of pa passive housing construction. So passive housing is the standard that they want to have in the community. Um, and they decided to build the health station in passive construction so that everybody in the community could get to experience um, the benefits of um, what passive construction does. And so this is strategic planning, you know, they, they wanted to get everybody excited about passive construction. And so instead of investing in, you know, somebody's house being passive housing, they, they decided to invest in a community building that everybody would get to be a part of. And um, so, yeah, and also this is part of capacity building as well, because, oops, sorry, that, that's part of capacity building as well, because um, the, the person who's, tr who's being trained in passive house construction, this will be, um, this project will earn him his certification. So um, it's, a, it's a really positive example of how, um, you know, capacity building uh, can develop alongside housing and energy efficiency all together. Um, and just before we end, I'm just going to show you a little video that um, I made just to speak about my, my research, just to give a little idea about my research.
So thank you, Chi Miigwech, to everybody um, for, for listening to my little webinar. And um, I welcome any questions that you may have. All right, well, thank you so much, Courtney, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, so at this point, we have some time for questions from the audience. Uh, as people are, are spending a, a moment to think about these questions, I'm going to watch a poll um, to get a sense of who we have in our audience. So you should see that poll pop up for you right now, and if you can uh, take a moment to respond to it. Great, well thanks for filling out the poll and to take a look at the results on the screen, we can see that we have um, a good chunk from First Nations administration, um, from NGOs, um, and then some representation from consulting, uh, fewer from First Nations Council, and then from local government. Okay, so as I mentioned before, you can type in any questions you may have into the question box. Um, and to start us off, I, I have one about um, the community planning component. You mentioned, Courtney, um, you, you talked about the community energy plans, and I wanted to know if um, your research participants talked about comprehensive community plans and how they, they might fit into the picture. Thanks for the question. Um, some of them mentioned that they had comprehensive community plans, but unfortunately, I didn't get any details about um, what exactly that entailed. Um, but um, I know that some of the, um, the capacity building projects, they came out of these comprehensive community planning, um, comprehensive community energy plans. Um, and also I know that um, some of the communities that I spoke to when they were developing their, their energy plans, um, they really focused on, on having the voices of everybody in the community. So um, some people spoke about, you know, wanting to get that range and have the, the young people's voice as well as elders' voices as well. So, um, so exactly how they went about, um, you know, forming those, those energy plans. I, I, I don't know the exact details of that, but I do know that it was really important to a lot of the communities to include everybody's voices in that. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question here from Gail, um, who's wondering if the higher costs after the smart meters were installed um, was due more to the time of use rates versus paying for the smart meter installation? Um, yes, time of use race rates were a huge thing for that community. Um, and so what was happening is a lot of people, they weren't even understanding their, their energy bills. So after Hydro One put in the, the smart meters, um, that's where the crisis in the community started because I guess before, um, people didn't have like huge energy bills like they did before the smart meters were installed. Um, but the the person I spoke with said that like from from that moment when they did the, the installation, that's when um, the community problems really started. Um, and yeah, part of that was due to not being able to really understand the building, the, the billing um, of Hydro One. And, um, you know, some people said that, um, in in another community, another remote community in Ontario um, that had the same problem, um, they said that there was one family who didn't even really use energy for a whole month. They just, um, you know, they they heated things or they used their barbecue to cook and they unplugged their fridge and um, because they wanted to see like how much they would save if they weren't using energy and essentially their bill didn't even change and that was because they were paying um, such a big delivery fee as well um, so there's the problem of the, the delivery fees for the remote communities um, as well as the time of use rates um, and then the problems with um, the back billing um, as well. So, so it was a combination of all those three that really led to 
to, to really high energy bills and um, and just people not being able to pay. Yeah, thanks for providing more details on that. Uh, we have a question from Peter that you mentioned West Moberly building passive houses, um, but that you also commented that there's interest in building more traditional styles. Um, did you find there was much tension between building in traditional styles and more modern energy efficiency styles? Um, and if so, how was that managed? Okay, that's a great question, actually. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, um, so when I spoke with Wes Moberly, they're the ones who are doing the, the passive housing. Um, and the and it was the New Hall community in Bella Coola that spoke about the importance of traditional of traditional design. So it it wasn't actually um, the same interview that was speaking about the importance of of passive housing and traditional design. So so there wasn't any real tension between those those two. But um, the person who I spoke with too, who who spoke to the the importance of traditional design. Um, said that you know that's something to look towards but um tailoring it for today you know so it's not necessarily going back to the traditional long houses or anything like that but incorporating aspects of those styles um into you know current buildings so um part of that for example could be having um, a wide open um, floor plan, you know, to promote circulation. So that's something that, you know, goes back to being, it's part of traditional design. It, it could be inspired by traditional design, but it's it's a bit of a departure as well. So it's, um, it's looking to traditions, but um, adapting them for today. Um, if that makes sense and answers your question. Mm -hmm. And one comment I wanted to add to that for Peter is if he's interested in that combination of traditional design and energy efficiency, uh, in one of our past webinars with Skeetches and First Nations, they mm -hmm. talked about uh, retrofitting the roundhouse design to incorporate energy efficiency. So if that's something that people are interested in, they can mm -hmm. take a look at that through our webinar library. Okay. Um, and just an additional comment from Gail is that Ontario has just approved that First Nations customers will no longer be paying distribution costs on reserve as of this summer. Okay. So good news nice. um, to That's hear. Um, and uh, next question from Gail. Um, do you think that the smart meters really affected the hydro consumption and billing? And did it increase these two components? Um, well, I know that in that community, um, it was the installation of the, the smart meters that sparked, that really um, sparked all the problems. But I'm, I'm not exactly sure on the, the details if it's because um, the consumption went up or, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm really not sure about that. And I don't, I don't want to speak to that just because I, I don't know the exact details, but um, I know that the community, um, they identified the installation of the smart meters as like the, I guess, the starting point of when all the problems started. Um, and so, but yeah, unfortunately, I don't have the details. So question from Leo on what funding is available in BC to begin energy planning for communities. Um, I don't know if you wanted to speak to that, Courtney, but I, I can address that too. So um, one of the funds from is the First Nations Clean Energy Business Fund that you can look into for this type of funding. Um, as well, what could be useful is uh, if you go to our First Nations Home Energy Safe website, um, you'll find that the BC Ministry of Energy and Mines has put together uh, a guide on different um, energy efficiency uh, and clean energy funding resources. Um, and this guide is fairly updated. It, it, they updated it back in 2016. So if you're interested in learning more, um, you can take a look at that or feel free to get in touch with me. Um, I will send you a, a message afterwards. Um, uh, 
Right. So I there's an additional comment from Gail um, about the the problems from using time of use rates, um, and then uh, a comment that um, having the fridge freezer on and perhaps other motors such as the dehumidifiers, um, furnaces, air conditioners uh, can add substantially to, mm -hmm. to energy bills. Um, so she, and in reflection to, to what you had said, she said that she didn't expect to see much change by, mm -hmm. by cooking on, on a barbecue. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have time for maybe one more question, if anyone um, wants to add that in there. Just looking through our list so far. So I, I don't see any more questions popping up. So I think that's a good time to wrap up our webinar. So I want to say thank you so much again for coming in, Courtney, for the research that you've done and all the time and effort you put into this project. Um, we really appreciate the, the work that you've done. Um, and thanks again for being here for this webinar and, oh, and speaking thanks. about your research. My pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you all for listening.